groups. Well, today we're going to um, continue in our sermon series in the book of First Thessalonians, and we find ourselves coming to uh, chapter 5 of First Thessalonians. Um, so let's just bow in prayer this morning. Um, God, I, I thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather here together to look at your word and to allow your spirit to speak to us, God. Father, we don't want to be just hearers of the word, but we want to be doers of it as well. And, and Lord, this morning, as we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we come to some sobering material and some exciting material at the same time. And God, we just pray that you'd open our hearts to see what it is that your spirit is saying to us through it this morning, that you'd help me to be able to bring this word to the people in a way that they would be able to understand and apply. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we, um, we spoke about the rapture last, uh, last Sunday. Wasn't that awesome? I love talking about the rapture. Because, you know, <laughs> we're told in detail about the trumpet call of God. And, you know, our life here in this world is just a tiny fraction of what eternity is. It's just a tiny little dot, barely visible. If you were to put the dot of our entire existence on the line of eternity, it'd be just this tiny little dot. But we have this time. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ, if we come to believe in Christ, we're going to be with Jesus. And when the last trumpet call comes, the dead in Christ will come, will come back here with, with Christ. And they'll be, they'll be resurrected in new bodies. And, and the, Lord's, the Lord's promise is that those who are alive and are, and are with uh, in, in the world and are still alive will be gathered with those who have gone before us. And we will be taken up into the clouds. And we're going to be forever with the Lord. That's exciting stuff. The dead in Christ raise first. And then we who remain are caught up with him, them together with him in the clouds. Isn't that encouraging? The Bible says that we should encourage one another with these words. So if you pass away and you know Christ, to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. And I don't know, maybe we're among those that have been chosen by God to be raptured. That would be awesome. I mean, we don't know, and we're going to talk a bit about that exactly the timeline, but we do know that the end is near. All who believe in the Lord and follow Him will be caught up together in the twinkling of an eye. And the teaching of Paul concerning this marvelous event is the context today leading into chapter 5. And, and when we look at the Bible and we read the Bible, we have to remember this, that when you turn into your Bible and you see these chapters and you see these verses, chapter 5 and verse 1, okay, that was not how the Bible was originally written. The Bible was actually written as a letter. And those reference points are just that. They're reference points to help us to find scriptures more easily and to pass on um, encouraging teaching and, and, and just to be able to follow it and put a framework to it so we can find our way around the Word of God. But sometimes, sometimes what happens because you have the system of chapters and verses is that we can break up the Word of God and kind of like separate passages one from another when in fact, when you read the Word of God, anytime you read a verse in the Word of God, remember when you take that verse and you, and, you, and you ask yourself, what does this mean? You need to look at what's before it, what's after it, the context of what it is, and how everything fits together. What does other passages in Scripture say about the same thing? It's all really important. I'm grateful for the the verses and the chapters, I don't know about you, it's like a library. It helps you find the books, right? It helps you find the different important things that we need to, to know. So from chapter 4, we learned that there's a trumpet call of God and that the saints are all going to be raptured to be with Jesus. And the subject is the second coming of Jesus Christ and the dialogue concerning the rapture of the church continues into chapter 5. 
This is a single thought. Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ and how everything is going to unfold. So here we have in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 and 2, he says this, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we, need not, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So in the verse, first two verses of chapter 5, we see Paul telling the people in Thessalonica that he doesn't need to write to them further about the times and dates surrounding the second coming of Christ and the rapture of his church. That's what he's saying. Well, why would Paul say this? Were the Thessalonians totally confident about the timing of events surrounding the rapture and the second coming of Christ? Were they privy to some special divine revelation or teaching from the apostles that we don't have here today? How about you? I, I don't know about you, but I would like to know the day and the hour that the, the second coming of Christ is coming. That'd be, to me, in my flesh, in myself, that would be tremendous. That would be tremendous because then I could make plans and I could kind of sort out things in my life to kind of mesh with the program of Scripture, right? It would be nice for us to be able to do that. But, but the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And Jesus was asked, actually, by his disciples for clarity on the finality of things. And after Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples for a period of 40 days, and, and he taught them, and he was sharing with them what they needed to know for the time when he would ascend and take his seat at the Father's right hand. And the disciples, just before Jesus ascended, after he was raised from the dead, right near the time when he was ascended. The disciples were curious a lot. They're like you and me. Curious. I'd like to know. I'd like to see the date. I'd like to have this program in my mitt. But Jesus, Jesus had something to say about this. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read this. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're like, is everything going to, are you going to establish your kingdom on the earth and take care of all this evil that we see around us? And he said to him, this is what he said. He said to them in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Hmm. Those disciples, they were curious a lot. They wanted to know when Jesus was going to take care of all the trouble in this world, where, when, when he would reveal himself in power, in triumphant glory before Israel. You see, in, in, in this passage in 1 Thessalonians, I, I don't think that Paul was saying that he had already told the believers everything about um, the second coming of Christ and how it was all going to unfold. I don't think he told the believers everything about it and the hidden details surrounding the timing of the second coming of Christ. You know why? I think Paul is echoing the fact that Jesus told his 12 disciples that, he actually, that they actually didn't know and they wouldn't know the times and the dates. Paul's saying this because he's telling them, you're not going to know. You want to know, but you're not going to. And there's a lot of us that spend a lot of time trying to figure out times and dates, and we get involved in all kinds of controversial stuff and books and endless genealogies and all this stuff, trying to figure it all out. And all it does is create controversy and division in the body of Christ. When God's saying, you're not going to know. <laughs> you're going to see the seasons. You're going to see the approach, but you're not going to know. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. That's what he told the original disciples, and that's what he's telling us today. <clears throat> he doesn't announce 
to anybody when he plans to do this. And anyone who says that they know that God has told them about times and dates that are to come, they're being deceitful and they're not speaking the truth because they're speaking against what the Lord has revealed in his word. Jesus, when he comes, is going to show up suddenly, unexpectedly, and surprisingly. In regards to the coming of Jesus, Paul knew that like a thief who breaks into a house, they're, he's going to come when you least expect it, when you're, you're not prepared for it. In the world's point of view, we're going to talk about how that applies to the church because it's a bit different for us. But the day of the Lord, okay, the day of the Lord will be a glorious day. It will be a glorious day of light and triumph for all the people who are followers of Jesus Christ. It'll be something that's beautiful beyond our wildest imagination. When that trumpet sounds and we're gathered together with Christ, oh my, and we see him in his glorified state as believers, wow, that's powerful. We're going to see the glorious light and triumph. But on the other side of the coin, there's a, there's a coin here and there's two sides to it. On the other side of the coin, it is going to be a terrible day of destruction and judgment for the ungodly in this world. The day of the Lord. Now people say, well, why should I live my life for Jesus? I have so much life that I'd like to live for myself and I want to do things my own way. I can... I can maybe have Jesus as an add-on right at the end of my life when I'm, you know, I got a couple months left to live. Well, then that's when I'm going to give my life to Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, when the apostle Peter says this, he says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming he has promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And that's assuming they even believe that there is a creation. We're in the last days, folks. Do we have scoffers out there that are saying this? Yeah, we do. So to those who reject Jesus so that they can live for themselves, do you understand that God has delayed his day of judgment against the sin in this world because he loves you? He's giving you an opportunity to turn away from your wickedness and your, your sin and to come in a saving relationship with him. Don't assume that the day of the Lord is, has not come because it's never coming. It will come. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. You may not love God, but he loves you, and he invites you to come. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The delay in the second coming of Christ is all about God's love for those who have not come. In verse 10 of that same chapter, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, echoing what Paul says. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And further to this, the Apostle Paul agrees in verse 3 of our text this morning. And he says this, While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The day of the Lord will come. It will come. And it's coming soon. Now there's a day called today where man has his say and man says, I am in control of my own destiny. I can do whatever I want because after all, I am God. 
Man might say this and man might have his day, but the day of the Lord is coming. It is coming. And for those of us who believe in Christ, the mission to take the gospel to those that do not know, who are blinded to the truth by their sin, is pressing. You are the body of Christ. You are the light of the world. You carry the Holy Spirit within you. He has called you to be his ambassadors, to share the light. Nobody will come to Christ outside the Holy Spirit drawing them. But the Holy Spirit wants to use you. Why? Because that is his choice. God wants to, in his sovereign will, use his people to take the message of salvation to the lost that are out there that are blind to their state. You see, from Paul's description preceding this day of the Lord, many will be lulled to sleep by some form of world political or economic delusion, the pursuit of pleasure. It's people, I'd rather be fishing than serving God. I'd rather be, whatever, riding my motorcycle across Canada than serving God. That's where life's all about. You know what? You don't know when you're fishing whether the grizzly bear is going to come up behind you and grab you, and, and that's it. And you don't know when you're driving across Canada on your motorcycle if some drunk driver comes out from behind uh, uh, another vehicle and, and smashes into you, and right now you're standing before the Lord, giving an account for your life. The Antichrist will promote a lie of peace and safety for the human race. The Antichrist spirit is already doing that. There will be a man of sin that will be revealed. But the Antichrist spirit is alive and well. And, and, there, and the Antichrist spirit is standing in opposition to God's word, the Holy Spirit and God's people saying, there is another way to peace and safety. Follow yourself. Follow your feelings. Serve yourself. Live for yourself. Do what you must do to make it for yourself so that you can be happy, so that you can live your life as you design it. That's the message. Peace and safety will come when everybody realizes that they're God. Look at the world around us. What a lie. The wars and rumors of wars that are taking place across our planet right now is a lie to say that there is peace and safety. It's deep darkness out there. The Bible predicts that people in the world in the last days will call darkness light, and they'll call light darkness. They will oppose and persecute the true saints and the message of Christ, who follow Christ in spirit and in truth. Oh, they'll get along with the church that isn't really the church, the church that is compromised and part of the world system, that is falsely called the church, they'll get along with that, fine. But for the true church of Christ, the believers in Christ who are submitted to the Lord and filled with his spirit, there will be clash, there will be resistance. They delight in wickedness and and do not desire the truth. But the tables will be turned suddenly. Those who delight in wickedness will be rudely awakened on the day of the Lord. The darkness and wickedness that they've been promoting will be exposed for the fraudulent lie that it is. At any moment of the second, at any moment the second coming of Christ could come. We don't know the day or the hour. We know the season. We're in the last days, but we don't know when Christ is coming. That's why the Bible tells us to prepare. To prepare, to be ready. You see, on that day, they will come to realize how mistaken they were to reject Jesus and stand in opposition to the truth. They will hear the trumpet call of God sounding and they will mourn profusely as they see Jesus Christ in all of his glory descending through the clouds of glory. They'll see Jesus and they'll mourn. They'll realize, I was mistaken. They'll know in an instant there won't be another atheist alive past that point because all will see the one who has been pierced. 
In Matthew 24, 27 to 31, Jesus said, For as lightning comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the skies and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And though then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And if we continue reading, I won't read the entire chapter of Matthew 24, but it's a good read. We come to verse 37 where we read through to verse 44. As it, is in the days of, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what, happen, what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have ha let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Friends, the day of the Lord is going to be both glorious and terrifying. Joy for the believer and a nightmare for the one who has not placed their trust in Jesus. You see, the Thessalonian church suffered under terrible persecution in Paul's day. They were subjected to horrible persecutions. And Paul wanted them to know that God loved them and that their wicked persecutors looked as though that they were flourishing, that they had the upper hand and they were going to overcome the church. But one day, Paul is saying all the suffering that the believers had to endure from this wicked world would end in a glorious deliverance because even though they might die in their physical bodies, this death would only be a temporary sting because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And those that believe in Jesus Christ will not be assigned to the grave. They will rise and be forever with the Lord. And that's you and I if we believe in the Lord. Isn't that exciting? See? So, if you want to know more about the day of the Lord, there is tons of scripture about the day of the Lord. I think there's over a hundred passages in the Bible that talk about this day. But the day of the Lord and its terrible nature for the unbelieving world, if you look into it in Isaiah chapter 13 from 611, write that down, it's a good read. There was a prophetic word given about this day, a mention of this day, and it was sown into Isaiah's prophecy concerning the destruction of ancient Babylon, but it has end times um, prophetic um, implications as well. So, what do we do here? Despite the terrible warning of what's going to happen in the world when Jesus appears, Paul wants us as believers to look at things a little bit differently. Paul encourages us with words of comfort in verses 4 and 5 of our text saying, but brothers and sisters... This is really cool. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are not children, or you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Praise the Lord. The light of Christ has shone into our hearts. We have the hope of eternity placed within us. The Spirit of God was given to each believer as a down payment guaranteeing what is to come. And a down payment isn't the full deal. It is only that. It is a down payment. It is a taste of what is going to happen in the future. It's a seal placed upon the people of God. His presence within us. The light within us. 
You're children of the light. You're children of the day. We don't belong to the night or the darkness. We're different. We're different than the world out there because we've been saved by the blood of Christ and we've been born again. Born again, not children, born of natural descent, but born of the Spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. If believers understood what's being said through the Bible about belonging to the Lord, it would, if they really understood, and myself included, our lives would be revolutionized. We would be so filled with joy, it wouldn't matter what came against us. Why? Because we know that it's only temporary. The joy of the Lord is our strength. This day should not surprise us like a thief. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the scale of things prophetically exactly, but we know that Jesus is coming. He's coming, and he wants us to be ready for his return. Don't let the fact that we're not suffering in the same manner as our fellow believers overseas lull us to sleep so that we become apathetic in our walk for Christ concerning the mission that he has for us here to participate in. So then he says, Paul says in verse 6, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We don't belong to the darkness. We don't belong to the night. It's not time for us to sleep in apathy, even though we've been given this gift of peace and serenity in our culture that other cultures around the world are not facing. There's people that give their lives on a daily basis because they stand up and say, I'm a, I'm a child of God I, and I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus for it is the power of God for the salvation of all people who believe. They stand up and they die. We stand up and nothing them watches well, we get a couple of ripples here and there. But because it's so nice and comfortable and calm, we get lulled into this apathy. And we, we buy into this world's lies that living is all about this day and what I can get out of the, the thing I can squeeze out of this day. It's all about this world. We can get so caught up distracted. See, he's saying here, the reason he's saying, let us not be like others who are asleep, awake and sober. Let's be awake and sober. The reason he's saying, um, let's not be like those who get drunk at night. The reason he's saying that is because there's a risk of us drifting in our walk with Christ to where we are living as though we're asleep. And then we're intoxicated by the pleasures of this world and the, the various things that this world has to offer, the carnival rides that the earth has to offer in its various forms, whether it's hobbies, whether it's, whether it's our work, whether it's our vacations, whatever it is. There's a, there's a danger here that we will get caught into that and we'll either be made like we're drunk where we don't reason we don't see the truth because we're so sloshed with this feeling of, oh, I want to get the most out of this life. So the mission of Christ becomes second fiddle because I want to satiate what I know, what I can experience here in this world, in this life. And Paul's saying, folks, let's not get caught into that. Let us, we belong to the day. Let's be sober, sober, putting on faith. And love is a breastplate, and hope of salvation is a helmet. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus encourages disciples to engage in his mission. Don't forget that the church here, the local church, is an extension of the mission of Christ. This is not Pastor Clint's church. This isn't your church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. And you are, you are paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. And you are commissioned because Jesus has called you into his service. He's given you the, the responsibility to be the light of the world. 
to participate with him in his good work, not because he needs us to, but because he calls us to, because he is good, he is faithful, he is true, he is just, and he is your father, and he loves you, and he wants you to experience the joy of participating with him in his good work. So, when it comes to church, God's like, folks, don't play church. Don't play church. There's too much at stake. The Lord is coming soon. The day of the Lord is on our doorstep. We don't know when, but we know it's coming. And we're to live as though every day could be that day. Our church will only shine as brightly for Christ in this world if the individual believers that make up the body of Christ come out from under the bowls and shine their light into the darkness. Are you tired? Some days, yeah. Are you weary? Yeah, some days I am. Some, many days I am. Are you weary of this world? Are you discouraged? I just want to get to the end of this. Just hold on to the end and then I'm going to go to glory. I think all of us face these feelings in certain proportions, in certain times of our lives. But folks, God has called us to be about our Father's business. He's called us to be about our Father's business. Because we're imitators of Christ and He was all about His Father's business. We need to be about the Father's business. There's very little time. If we're sitting at home disengaged with serving in the mission of the Church of Christ, Maybe for whatever reason, there's a multitude of reasons. I got this to do, I got that to do, I got here to go, I got there to go. You don't understand my circumstances. I got this pressure, I got that pressure. I'm all over the map with this. Guess what? This world of sin, we are going to be laid out and, and God is calling us to lay our lives down and say, here is my life, Lord. Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waited, yielded, and still. God, have mercy upon me. I don't have the capacity in my own human strength to serve you, to serve your mission, to engage in the giftings that God, you have given me. I don't have the capacity to do it. I don't have the energy to do it. I don't have the health to do it. I don't have the mental capacity to do it. I don't have the time to do it. God is saying, Today, yes, while it is still today, you have time to do it. You might not be able to do what you used to do, but you can do something that God will show you to participate with him in his kingdom work. See, the devil is going to try to render us ineffective and unproductive in our mission by putting a multitude of circumstances in our path. Maybe we face painful circumstances that make us want to curl up in our beds and make the world go away as we pull the covers over our head. That happens to me. I've had that happen to me, and I've actually fallen into that. Make the world go away. Let me just have my little corner. Covers over the head. Maybe I get sidelined by distractions of worldly pursuit. Going here, going there, seeking seeking out the treasures of this world. I remember when I was a younger guy, I was a, 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 like a, a really engaged athlete. I lived, ate, and breathed my, my sport. It was my God. I wouldn't admit it at the time, but it was my God. Everything I did surrounded my sport and how I could improve it, how I could benefit from it, how I could fine-tune it and I'm not talking about discipline, but my heart was given over to it. And I wasn't involved in my church. I wasn't involved in the things that God had called me to. I had taken that stuff and set it off to the side and said, I don't have time for that because I'm too engaged with my sport. I'm not saying that's you. I don't know your heart. You know your heart before God. Is there something in between you and God in serving him? You need to lay it down. You need to pour yourself out like a drink offering on the sacrifice. Like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And he was a drink offering that poured himself on the sacrifice. Why? 
Because the mission of Christ is the most important mission of your entire life. Your sport isn't important. Your hobby isn't important compared to this. Your work isn't important compared to this. That's all second fiddle stuff. And don't worry, God knows what you need. He, he wants you to engage in, it, in your giftings and your abilities and, and we can enjoy the fruit of, of our labor and the hobbies that we have. Yes, those are great gifts of God, but we can't let them take the place of God. Because then we're falling into this. We're getting drunk on the world system. We're getting drunk on it and we're getting satiation, uh, satiation from, from the things of this world. And it's only a hollow, hollow, hollow counterfeit for the riches that they're in Christ. When you serve Christ out of an obedient heart, there is abundance of riches that this world can't even compare to. When you're filled with the Spirit and you're engaged in the mission of Christ, each one of us is part of the body of Christ. Each one of us has a calling. Each one of us has a mission. Mm. it's time it's time to recognize maybe if we've let things get between us and the Lord and to surrender those things oh God you know when we're talking about communion this morning we can be off track we can get led astray we can make mistakes we can do willful things that are wrong and God says come to me If you recognize that you're living in sin, sin is disobedience. It's not just, you know, the five cardinal things, right? If our life is in disobedience to the call of God, we're living in sin. And we need to repent and come back to the the root of what it is to be a Christ-like one. That might mean, that might mean, putting time out of your schedule to prepare for a class, getting your truck and jumping in to help someone who needs a furniture delivery. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying that there's a multitude of things out there that we are called to. And if you're not doing what God's called you to do, the rest of the church suffers. And we're not impacting our community and the world the way God wants us to because it's all about Jesus. And the sooner we come to realize that, the more goodness is going to flow into us. Oh, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You can't. I want this for me. It's not God's, it's mine. No, no, no. Give it to God. He will, He's a master of turning water into wine, He's the master of taking a couple loaves of, and a couple fishes and feeding thousands of people. Why? Because it's not about us and our abilities or our talents. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need us, but he calls us. And when we give the bread of life through our hands, through our mouth, we give the bread of life to others because God has given us bread. And we're just bread distributors, right? Pastor Clint is just a bread distributor. There's nothing special about me outside of the fact that I'm a saved, born again, child of God who loves the Lord dearly and I'm called to be doing this ministry as an under-shepherd of the Lord to care for your souls. And you have a part to play in this too. And you know what? The the behind-the-scenes ministries, the Bible says says that those are greater sometimes than the the upfront ministries, Right? Don't say, oh, I can't do anything for the Lord. No. Remember that tale or the uh, the parable? No, it's not a parable, sorry. The story of the widow in the the temple? She comes with this little little bit of change and puts it in there in the temple treasury as a gift to the Lord. And her heart was good. Her heart was in it. She was giving all that she had because it was, she recognized that everything she had belonged to the Lord and it was given to her as a blessing to to the Lord, and she gave all that she had. And Jesus pointed at her, and there's high-ranking officials and priests and Pharisees and all that dropping stuff in, big checks into the... No. Who gave more than all of them? That lady. This is what I'm trying to say. Don't say, I can't do something. God has called you to do something. 
You're not saved by works, folks. But works is a litmus test for how my heart is. If it's all about me, myself, and mine, we got our priorities in the wrong basket. It's all about Jesus, the glory of his kingdom, and the state of lost souls coming to salvation in Christ. That's what our world's got to be focused on. And if we do this, we do this, everything else will be added to us as well. God's not calling you to ruin your life. He's calling you to give you abundant life. Amen. Do you see the fields that are white unto harvest? Do you see the mission that God has for us to participate with him in? The potential in this assembly, this little assembly, is immense to impact this generation for Christ. Don't undersell that because it's not about what we bring to the table. It's about what Christ does in multiplying what we bring. As the church, as the bride of Christ, we must see that the wedding supper of the Lamb is just on the other side of tomorrow. God forgive us if we put our light under a bowl. God forgive us. I can't do everything. You can't do everything. But all of us can do something. There's time to rest on the other side of the race. Right now is the time to run in such a way as to win the prize. An athlete that runs in such a way as to win the prize isn't like the kid at the milk run that walks around the block, you know, and takes two hours to get there. No, that's not, that's not the Christian walk here, people. The people is to, to be engaged like an athlete who runs to win the prize. That means pouring everything. Oh, if you give God everything you are and everything you have, he will return unto you his fullness. The seven, he'll, it'll be sevenfold. That means the fullness of God. You give him everything you are, everything you had. You can't do that on your own, but by Christ, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, Lord, I can't give you my heart because I'm too weak. Well, guess what? Lord Jesus, take my heart. Take my heart. Make it all work out, Lord. And you serve the Lord. He is faithful. He is faithful. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Friends, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you're doing. There's a lot of great stuff that's going on in our, in our congregation. There really is. Man, last night, you know, like I saw some of it, you know. There were a bunch of people came together and put this float together. Someone donated this. Someone came and gave their time for that. And then other people came out and walked with it. And, and it may not seem like a big deal. And what's a float in a parade? Well, guess what? We're, we're pointing to Jesus as being this world's answer. And we're telling the community that we're part of you. We're engaged with you. We, we want to share with you what we have been given. And it's not all about this other stuff. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about, you know, who's got the most decorations and all this, you know, in life. Right? That's the distraction. That's the carnival. We're all about showing people that we know God and we have bread for their hungry souls. There's water for their thirsty souls. There's bread for their hungry souls that they don't realize even that they need. They feel the hunger pangs, but they don't realize they need it. But we are the light of the world. Amen. Those people who did that, praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm not here to pick people out and say, this is more important than this. No, no, that's not, a, that's not the point. Because everyone has got a part to play. But those people, as an example, like I saw that as a pastor. I'm like overjoyed. And some of them were tired. You know, one guy was up there trying to lift something up, and he's like, oh. I'm like, hey, here's a screw gun. <laughs> Let some of the strong back do that, right? That's okay. That's a blessing. But willingness. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward.
And let's just bow, everybody in this place today, let's just bow. Lord, we're so thankful for your goodness and your graciousness, Lord. Your patience with us, God. Sometimes, God, I'm such a stubborn, blockheaded person. And I know many of the other people around here can be that too because we're human and, God, you understand we wrestle with things. So, God, we just ask that you'd have mercy on us, that you'd help us, Lord, to see things the way that you see them, that, God, you'd empty us of ourselves so that we could be filled with you. God, I pray for every person in this place. You have a design for them. They're precious to you, Lord. They You've called them out of the darkness into your glorious light. Maybe there's someone here today that has never surrendered to you yet. There is light and life in you, Lord. I pray that those people would see that. And for those that are saved, God, that, are, that have just been kind of going through the motions just to make it through, Lord, I pray that they would, they would be engaged with your mission once again, that you'd fill them with your spirit and give them ideas on how they could serve you collectively together arm in arm with the saints that call this place home because we are at home lord we are a family we're a family of believers and we thank you for that thank you for peace thank you for the right that we have to gather lord lots of people don't have this god we don't want to squander it we don't want to just be about ourselves about gathering into our own little groups and focusing in on ourselves and what we can get out of it. No, we want to be about your work, Lord. So forgive us, Lord, when we get sidetracked and we forget what it's all about. I pray that discipleship would circle around the mission, vision, and values that we have as our church. Lord, forgive us when we stumble. Forgive us when we falter. Forgive us when we're tired. Fill us with your strength. God, we can't help sometimes feeling tired. But Lord, you can renew us in our strength. You said that they will, that weight upon you will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. We need that, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Give us your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on each one of you this morning.